think there's clearly a mistake here because Lydia wrote her name and then some miscreant crossed it out. <laughs> so um, I think I should rewrite that name in. Is that is that the consensus here? Yes. yes. Yeah. Drag her on stage. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I think so. No, so. I don't See, she planned ahead. All right. Well, next year, we're gunning for you. Next year. All right. Um, let's see. So what we're going to do is the same as yesterday. Um, the person who comes up to read for five minutes crosses his or her name off after reading and then um, calls someone else at random. And to the extent that it's possible, we can try to sort of vary, alternate between fiction writers and poets. Okay? Um, well, you kind of know who you know who the poets are. They're the ones with the long, stringy hair and stuff. You know? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, no, I mean, if what we can do is if if um, if there are like you know th three fiction writers in a row and a fourth fiction writer gets called, you can just holler, choose someone else. You know, okay, we'll do it like that. Oh, all right. Is that true? I think you're right. All right, so it's a day, a day of a lot of fiction. Just Marjorie is, is the poet, so... Oh, Doug, Doug. Okay, good. Doug, yeah, you're, on, you're 15. Okay, great. You're on here. All right, so let's start out with Mark Cronin. And you know what? I want to... Is it too bright up there? You guys want a little darker in the audience? This is the start of a story called uh, Warm Sugar Donuts and a Pint of Milk, uh, the title of which is uh, half too cute and too soft for the story, so we'll change, but otherwise this is uh, close to the way it's going out. Had you asked me the morning of the first accident, I would have told you I was happily married to the former Eileen Hickey and expected to be so for many years to come. That Wednesday, I followed the rituals of my daily commute, dragging the plastic garbage can to the curb, checking the latest lotto prize as I drove past a stationery store window, stopping at the deli on Woodbury Road for what qualified as breakfast. Outside the deli, cars swooshed by in a steady rush hour pace. The lead bicyclist blurred past me, his presence barely registering, one of those events you don't see until asked about later. I carried a small brown bag with my buttered roll in one hand, my coffee cup in the other, the warmth rising through the plastic lid. A big old powered blue Buick slowed down. I remember that, the oddity, no turn signal, nothing blocking the way. I rolled up Newsday and stuck it under my arm so I would have a free hand to grab my keys. The second bicyclist whirred behind me. First came the scream. A raw, physical, desperate cry. The old Buick had suddenly jerked right, turning into a driveway. The bicyclist had too much speed, too much momentum. Her front wheel slammed into the side of the car and collapsed, the spider-like lattice of spokes giving way as if made of sugar. Then came the metal-on-metal metal crash and screech of the bike frame slamming into the fender. The rider hurtled over the handlebars, her body a rag, neither rising nor falling, but sailing for a long moment. She thudded on the pavement and bounced, her head and legs flapping, her body thumping to the ground again and rolling once, twice, three times before skidding to a halt. I put my coffee and the brown bag on the roof of the car and must have let the newspaper drop. She still wore her helmet, though a pool of blood thick, barely fluid, already masked under her head. Traffic stopped, and all the normal noise gave way to the hush of a giant inhaled breath. I do not remember deciding to walk toward her. 
The other cyclist, who turned out to be her husband, a David Frankel, stopped maybe 40 yards ahead. He craned his neck to look back, then threw his bike to the ground, first walking, then faster, then running, sprinting, his arms pumping. With one hand, he yanked his helmet from his head and tossed it aside. With his black hair, bushy beard, and barrel chest, he looked like Bluto from the Popeye cartoon, or maybe a stevedore, not a bicyclist at all. His eyes widened with murderous intent, and I held my hands up to signal I didn't do it. His wife had still not moved. The husband reached her but hesitated, then halted and stood absolutely still. I, too, stopped. Drivers peered over their car hoods, cell phones in hand. People shouted back and forth, call an ambulance, call an ambulance. She, whose name turned out to be Barbara Frankel, lay with her knees curled in the fetal position. Her shoulder bled, a wound like a pond, the blood shimmering. She wore a plain white top tank, now scuffed with sand and roadside dirt. She had the delicate wrist of a ballerina. A car horn sounded from far behind. The husband next, knelt next to her, his hands and arms opening to hold her, yet afraid to touch her. He looked up at me, his large, angular face gone soft. He was like a drowning man who would clutch at any rescuer. His look pulled me down with him. I lowered into a crouch, then tipped forward on my knees, the gravel from the pavement stinging. Her eyes had grayed over like plastic, as if they had never been real. Her breathing had no pace, no rhythm. I told him we can't move her. He remained mute, staring at me, then her. I'll try to staunch the blood, I said, and placed my hand against her head, the sticky warmth of blood running through my fingers and down my palms. She had spit on her lips that barely moved with her weakened breath. Where were the sirens, the ambulances? The husband said, We'd already ridden 25 miles. We were almost home. He said it like a complaint, the stupidity, the unfairness, as if this could not have happened. 25 miles, we were almost home. With my left hand, I reached for his arm, thick and muscular, damp with sweat, and his pulse frenzied. She'll be all right, I said. We'll just wait for the ambulance. He leaned close to her, the curled hairs of his beard brushing against her ear. His voice ached as he said, Come back, come back. People crowded the scene and spoke in stage whispers. Up the hill, a train rumbled past. The old deli guy pointed at us, his bulging belly covered by a dirty white smock. The woman who drove the car, bony and hunched over like, an, like old women get, paced around her front yard. She kept asking, Did I do this? And answered, I couldn't have done this. A police cruiser pulled up. The husband stood, threw his arms out, and screamed at no one in particular. The ambulance! My wife! Where's the ambulance? The crowd stepped back. He fell to his knees again, pressed his lips against her ear, and kissed her, whispering, Come back! Come back! She did not respond. His eyes filled with the terror that nothing would hold true ever again. Never had I felt so total the presence of another human, so dense, so solid, creating its own gravity, pulling me out of myself. I had so little to give, could only repeat my words, tell him that she would be okay. I put more pressure on her head, felt the goo of her ripped flesh. Her eyes flickered, their color came back a pale blue. Her breathing found a rhythm, she moved her legs. I placed my hand on the black nylon riding shorts, pushing her leg down, saying, You need to hold still. Just hold still. Her husband kissed her forehead. He exhaled as if expelling demons. His wife's questions came in bunches, her voice full of fright and accusation. Where am I? Why am I in the street? What happened to my bicycle? He giggled. He ran his finger along the edge of her eyebrow to wipe away a bead of sweat. He answered her and kissed her shoulder. She flinched. He said, you'll be okay. Everything will be okay. The muscles in his arms bulged. She stretched to touch her husband, cringing in pain. Still, sh still she held his arm, pulled him closer, asking again, where am I? What happened? Um, five minutes, right? Okay. Um,
Toby Hecht. Okay, this is a little lighter in spirit. Called A Postcard Not Received. When Lloyd, my boyfriend of two years, left me and New York to find himself in rural Greene County, Virginia, I wept in the dark for a week, ate pint after pint of chubby hubby ice cream, and called in sick at work. It's just for a short time, kiddo. Don't take it that way, he had said flatly, without so much as a glance in my direction. He was too busy rooting around the place, looking for the last vestiges of his belongings, as though to destroy the evidence of a crime. I was amazed at his thoroughness, considering he never picked up anything at all during our time together. Closing the last suitcase, he kissed my forehead, smiled faintly, and said, I'll send you a postcard, and heaving the baggage through the doorway gave me, his unwanted baggage, the final heave-ho. I pictured him standing in the hallway on the other side of the door, pumping his arm to the ceiling in a silent, yes. After a week of mourning for what might have been, I ran out of tears. I convinced myself that it was only a matter of time before Lloyd could mull, would mull things over too and come to the realization that what he had with me was damn good. His foolhardy fantasy of helping his friend Jim start a small vineyard was bound to run into snags. Lloyd's idea of manual labor was carrying a laptop computer from one client to another. It was inevitable he would return home to me. Lloyd, ahead of his time in just about everything, was having his midlife crisis early. I began to wait at the mailbox for Mr. Howard, the postman who delivered the mail to my family for the past 25 years for a postcard from Lloyd. My parents had retired and moved to New Mexico three years before, entrusting me with the better-than-gold, rent-controlled, pre-World War I walk-up apartment in which I had grown up. Like most things, one gets what one pays for. It was on its last leg. The superintendent gave up on cosmetic repairs years ago. A smell of mothballs, old linoleum, and chicken soup permeated the hallways. The house was said to be in a transition neighborhood. I understood that term to mean a community that people move into long enough to realize how unpleasant it is to live there and then move out as soon as possible. I seem to be the sole long-term survivor of the urban neglect in this particular part of the city, and I took some enjoyment in learning various vulgar words of the languages of each ethnic wave that arrived to fill the va neighborhood vacuum. Although all of my friends from work lived in the trendier parts of the city, in co-ops with doormen, I stayed put. The rent for the old apartment was practically nothing and the building was only one block from the first stop of the A train, the train I took to work. I could not imagine any right-minded New Yorker giving up the assurance of a subway seat merely for a decent place to live. Throughout all the changes over more than two decades, Mr. Howard continued to deliver the mail precisely at noon. I was comforted by his constancy, especially since the major players of my life lately seemed to be just passing through. Mr. Howard must have had dozens of apartment buildings on his rounds, with new occupants every month, but he knew everybody by name and something about everyone. When I was a young child, I imagined him early in the morning at the post office, steaming open letters and reading the mail before his shift started. But as I grew up, I realized that Mr. Howard was one of these people in whom others confided, like a favorite uncle. Now I had a tale to tell him, one that would rank right up there with the best over the last two decades. I knew of all people, Mr. Howard would be on my side. Finding oneself to him would mean shameless, shamelessly indulging oneself, a sin that could have been included in the Ten Commandments. It was 12.15 and the mail had not come yet. In a few minutes, I'd have to turn around and take the subway back to work. It was crazy to spend each lunch hour run, rushing home, eating a sandwich along the way, only to face Mr. S Howard's empathetic gaze as he said, Sorry, sweetheart, nothing for you today. I got into this routine soon after returning to work after my so-called illness, 
when I realized that I couldn't concentrate on spreadsheets and cost estimates in the afternoon, knowing that the blueprint for my life could be lying at that very moment behind the narrow brass door of the mailbox. I turned down lunch dates with coworkers, avoided business appointments over the noon hour, and deferred errands until the end of the day. I was obsessed. If Lloyd had anything to say to me, it would be in writing. This much I knew. He detested talking on the telephone with its uncomfortable pauses, where one never knew if the other party fell asleep or simply put down the receiver to do something more productive. The first time he told me that he loved me, it was by email. The next day, he moved in. There's, a, there's no pen or anything up here, so... Um, Cecilia. Um, this is from a short story called My Palestine. Lottie has a crazy woman's laugh. She starts laughing on a high strangled note of desperation and then she gasps and laughs, gasps and sucks in another breath and laughs. Then she gulps another breath before a new peal of laughter, higher and shriller and more anguished than the one before it. When I first heard that laugh, I thought she was going off the deep end. She looks like she is. Lottie's red hair pokes from her head in long Medusa-like coils that frame her pasty white face like rusty accordion wire. Her skin is prematurely wrinkled, a gift of her nicotine habit and her light blue eyes have a way of deceptively wandering until they suddenly fasten on you in unwavering stare. She takes another drag off the menthol cigarette that's always dangling between her fingers and I think, no, she just can't breathe anymore. Besides her love affair with nicotine, Lottie is passionate about Palestine. Lately, she's been reading everything she can find about Sabra and Shatila and the terrible attacks, mutilation, and slaughter of hundreds in those camps. Every conversation with Lottie leads to the same place, where the young, old, mothers, children, fathers, brothers, sisters, cousins, aunts, teachers, shopkeepers, resistance fighters, and babies found themselves on that day in Lebanon. Lottie and I met through our mutual interest in the Middle East, you see. Otherwise, we'd probably never have had much to say to each other. My friend Bob thinks she's a bit quirky, but I say, hold on there. She's really committed, Bob laughs. You mean she should be committed. All the same, she looks outside her own little box, I say. And she's got somebody else's interest in mind. At that point, Bob raises his left eyebrow in that irritatingly superior way of indicating that he doesn't think so. I say, maybe Lottie does have a screw loose, but it's not in a place that matters. Lottie and I met at an American Friends Service Committee meeting where a well-known human rights activist was to speak about her recent trip to the West Bank. Just as the speaker clears her throat and is about to begin, the door behind the podium bursts open and a large tall woman with unruly red hair clutching a book satchel darts in front of the speaker. What nerve! She comes down the aisle and settles herself onto the empty seat next to me. Well, I think one should do whatever one can. I know the rest of the world is in a sorry state, indeed I do. But this woman's fervor seems rather overboard to me. Whenever the speaker makes a particularly dramatic point, my neighbor nods her head agitatedly and turning toward me actually grabs my arm and says, but what's to be done? What's to be done? I study her out of the corner of my eye. She is dressed in a large black coat in spite of the mild spring weather. Suddenly I realize I have seen her before, rapidly walking down the main street of our little college town, her long black coattails sailing behind her. She seems to wear that coat in even the most temperate weather, as though protecting herself from a moral chill. As the speaker winds up her talk and takes questions from the audience, my impetuous neighbor leaps to her feet, 
A stack of pamphlets slides off her lap onto my lap and the floor. Yes, she says. Yes, yes, that's the point. And then goes on for five minutes to enlarge upon what I at least felt were the perfectly adequate remarks of the Nobel Prize nominee who has been speaking. I pick up one of the pamphlets in my lap and unfold it, but then I refold it quickly. One can discuss them, but pictures of atrocities are a bit over the line, I do think. One can help without total immersion in the pathos of the rest of humanity. At the end of the talk, I rise to leave, but my way is blocked by my enthusiastic neighbor. She is still sitting, shaking her head. There is so much to do, so much, she is saying. Finally, she looks up and notices I am standing there. Oh, sorry, she exclaims. It takes her a minute to stuff her pamphlets back into her satchel. She stands up with an energetic heave that pushes her chair back against a man still standing in the row behind us. Then she fastens her pale blue eyes upon me and says, Lottie Chernov, care for a coffee and a chat? I'm not entirely sure I do, but I say yes. Bob accuses me of collecting human curiosities, and maybe he is right. All I know is that an invitation to a cup of coffee by someone who looks like an upscale bag lady with close connections to the Salvation Army is more than I can resist. So off we go around the corner to Emil's, where over cups of burnt coffee we talk about the state of the world. I feel an obligation to help those who are less well off than myself, and I do pride myself on keeping up with current events especially the Middle East, what with our oil supplies endangered and all that. I certainly don't believe in sticking our heads in the sand. And as a librarian, I have a professional duty to keep up on world events. So I was pleased to find someone who could talk knowledgeably about the Middle East. But I soon discover that for Lottie, this goes way beyond interest. And it isn't only the Palestinian people upon whom Lottie obsesses. Palestine, the homeland, Lottie labors as much and sorrows for Palestine as though it were her lost child. How are things going with your friend Lottie, Bob asks over lunch. Oh, not bad, I say. She actually does have some very good points. Hmm, we're not going to be seeing you marching downtown with a placard now, are we, says Bob. Of course not. What do you think? What do you take me for? I say, laughing at the thought. Marjorie Wanner? Did I spell it right? Well, here we are, writers. So here's my poem, Writer's Block. <laughs> Start with a lost dog trotting along a road. That's the key when words won't come. There he was yesterday, a small, black, breedless dog trotting along our dusty road. Two hours later, I saw him wandering down the right lane, moving over only when a car came, stopping and turning full around to watch it trail away. This morning, he lies in the middle of the road. Cars slow down and drive around him. I'd like to think some hunter took this pup hunting too young, and he is only lost. But I've seen too many car doors fling open. Too many little black dogs come flopping out. I would forego a villanelle the likes of that good night for one less little lost dog trotting along my country road. Beginnings. This is another one. Beginnings. Moving China in cardboard cartons from my house to his, beginning a new life with a new husband. I see among the packing claws I gave him tossed askew in the back of his Pontiac, that dark, drab, old wool quilt, 80 squares of black and gray. I want to snatch it back, tell him it's too good to cover furniture, but it was old when I first saw it 40 years ago, discarded already, to the, ratly seat, to the rear seat of that ratly robin's egg blue coupe of my first love. I remember it, a giant checkerboard lying under a starry sky in the middle of a meadow, 
moisture seeping through its batting. The night was warm, mosquitoes droning, landing on our sweaty skins, fireflies. Unexpectedly, the memory comes flooding back, guilt-ridden still, like the dampness spreading through my cotton skirt that summer night. And I think of myself as a poet, but since I've been here, I wrote a thing that I don't think is a poem. <laughs> she, the, the teacher said, uh, write a sonnet, and before I, got to, before I got to the sonnet, I wrote this. Parlor bedroom memory. My husband lies on the brass bed in the parlor bedroom, the man I married when I was 18 and pregnant. We spent our first married night in that parlor bedroom bed. My parents in their bed on the other side of the wall, probably not sleeping either. Thirty years and forty children later, he has come home from the hospital to spend his last breath with me. Friends and family are dropping in. They know, and we know, they've come to say goodbye. Jack, the bachelor, who has lived across the road for 18 years, has just gone home. The house is so still it creaks. Ray is napping. I'm doing dishes in that automated way that happens when death gets bigger than life. I wash dishes so I don't have to think. And so some will be clean if we decide to eat again sometime. I'm drying the dishes when the bedside bell rings. I go to him. Sit, he says. I sit. Put down the dish towel, he says. I put down the towel. You know, he doesn't waste a second getting to this one, one, one more instruction on how I should go on living when he's gone. His list has been long. He has this one well thought out. You know, he says, all these years I've told you, when I die, whatever you do, don't marry Jack. You'll both be reading and the house will fall down around you. <laughs> well, he says, if Jack shows any serious interest in you, give him a chance. He doesn't wait for me to answer. Jack deserves the love of a good woman, he says. Two weeks later, Ray is dead. That's for those of you who heard me uh, <clears throat> trashing Jack at the Merrill House. <laughs> we had a school shooting at our uh, area quite a few years ago now, but this is one of the poems I wrote about it. One old farmer's solution to school shootings. Give a boy a shovel. Let him pitch manure. Let it be February when the cows are in the barn all day and all night, and everything they eat turns to steaming sludge. Let the cows be asleep with their tails in the trench when he opens the barn door. Let his back strain against shovel weight until he feels pain in every muscle and is saturated with the stench of wet manure. Let him carry water to the house before he washes, changes clothes, and eats. Let him walk five miles to school. Maybe then he won't have time to kill. And Jack has been such an inspiration to me. You all know he's been such an inspiration to me. Here's one more he inspired. War. He is hunting for a knife. In the knife drawer, I yell from the living room where I am waging a war with words trying to pommel them into a poem. It's not here, he calls back. <laughs> Pull out the drawer, I yell, and look again. The words, sensing diversion, break, begin to break ranks. I batter them down and bring them into line again. My new carving knife with a black handle, he calls. It's there, I shout. The words are scrambling now. I looked, he calls. The words rise up in full revolt and slay me. <laughs> I go to the kitchen, pull open the drawer, take out the knife, and while I stand there with knife in hand, he asks, did you finish the poem? <laughs> Nancy Middleton. Okay. 
I'm going to read the beginning of a story called Shipbuilding. It was um, published last year in the South Carolina Review, and hopefully it will be a novel. <laughs> okay. In the 21 years Connor Mandy had lived alone, he'd become noteworthy in Bayville for two things. He didn't drink, and he didn't chase women. He didn't cultivate these virtues so much as have them befall him. Until eight years ago, he'd been a fisherman. He'd cast off in darkness each morning, guiding the Darcy Jean to the spots off Cape Ann his father had shown him as a boy. There he set lobster traps and nets for halibut. The days were long, but he cleaved to them. He had been raised to the sea. When he put in at night, his body spent, his hands reeking of chum and diesel fuel. He wanted only his dinner and bed. He was accustomed to solitude. And so when Darcy, his daughter, accepted a teaching job in Phoenix and his wife Barbara followed her, Connor adjusted to life alone with an ease that surprised even him. He took up bird watching. He bought a Labrador and named her Misty. He read voraciously history, nautical fiction, the autobiographies of famous men. When he was diagnosed with a weak heart and forced to retire, he rediscovered his childhood hobby of model shipbuilding and simply transferred his fisherman's discipline to the craft. He came to see himself as a survivor, stronger and more self-reliant than those who spent Saturdays at the Duck Inn on the highway. It was spring, early evening. Connor was sitting, just sitting down to eat when the phone rang. It was somebody named Ross Curtis. He was vacationing in Bayville and wanted Connor to make him a ship. Let's meet, he said, at your shop. The voice was forceful. It caught him off guard. Come at eight, Connor said. There's two of us. All right. Connor hung up, feeling put upon. Tourists, he muttered. He fed the rest of his ham sandwich to Misty. He lit a cigarette. Bayville was changing, and he didn't like it. There used to be lots of families, a couple crab shacks, some campsites and A-frames outside of town. Now the streets were crammed with fancy inns and restaurants. Huh, he said, money. He set his plate in the sink and retreated to his workshop, back to the problem he'd put off before dinner. The schooner he had been shaping was uneven. He sat down and took the ship in his lap. There was a tiny bulge on the port side near the bow. He stroked it, wishing he had smaller or at least more sensitive fingers. Sometimes he looked at his ships and was amazed that a log-fingered guy like him could turn out such fine work. He set the hull down and turned on the belt sander. The radio played New York, New York. A little after eight, Misty stood up and barked. They were here. Connor made one more pass over the hull. He blew the dust away and rubbed it with his thumb. He'd have to finish it later. He switched off the machine. As it wound down, he heard a voice calling out, Anybody home? He brushed sawdust off his hands and stepped into the hall. In the dim light stood two people, a couple. The man had come down the hall and stood just a few feet away. The woman hovered beside the front door, gripping the doorknob as if she might take off any second. Ross Curtis, the man said, extending his hand. Connor Mandy? He nodded and shook the man's hand, which was large and soft. We saw your boats, Ross said, down at the Schooner Fair gift shop. The woman cleared her throat. Ross beckoned for her to come closer. My fiancé, Maura. Hello, she said. Hey there, said Connor. He smoothed his hair, conscious of how he looked to them, old and must, with two days stubble across his chin. He took off his glasses and eyed the couple. Young people looked all alike these days, slim and well-dressed, with smooth faces that had not seen misfortune. The man wore tiny steel-rimmed glasses, he smelled of breath mints and smiled too much. The fiancé surprised Connor. She was Slavic, like Barbara. He recognized the face, the broad expanse of her nose and cheeks, the waxy skin. She wore large, hammered brass earrings, the kind they sold at the shops in town. We love your boats, Maura said, and we wondered, Ross intervened, if you might make us one. Well, Connor intended to tell them no, that he was busy. Ross held up a finger. Wait, he said. We want a special boat. He fished a colorful flyer from his pocket and spread it open. The Loring, he said as proudly as if showing off his own ship. 
Connor knew the Loring. A tour boat, it sailed out of town twice nightly. Dinner cruise, moonlight cruise. A nice clean yacht with an aft sail and crew dressed in striped jerseys to make vacationers feel they had had an adventure. He could sometimes catch a glimpse of it from the cove. He took the flyer from Ross and examined it. Over the years, he'd made people all kinds of ships, tugboats and schooners and frigates and sloops. Some had been made to spec, some from kits. Many had been of his own design. He'd never been asked to do this one. Stop there. <laughs> Uh, Jeremy D'Angelo. Hello. Um, I'm going to read from a novel that I just started called uh, tentatively The Portuguese. Um, it takes place in southern Africa around the turn of the last century. And um, I think all you really need to know is that there's two Mozambican colonists, uh, one a traitor, the other a disgraced priest, and they've both decided to smuggle diamonds. It was not too much of an inconvenience to meet the pie on my rounds, seeing as that the hinterlands were my home territory. I was a liaison, a commercial connection between the ports and the pioneers, bringing supplies from the centers of commerce into the interior and carrying staples out. In truth, this was an oversimplification, and a rather pompous one at that. As my dabbling in the diamond trade makes perfectly clear, I'm an opportunist, as versatile as and no better than a jackal in the veld. I'll barter for goods or accept cash, but never credit. And my clients range from the relative sophisticates of cosmopolitan Beira to boars, old Prazo holders, natives, and even bandits if they're willing to trade equitably. Over the years, thousands of products have passed through my hands. Arms and ammunition for the tribes in exchange for crafts and gold, wine from Cape Colony, wool from the Transvaal, Turkish rugs and palm oil from the north. And now I was involved in IDB, the illicit diamond buying, and felt no compunction about it. Honor and trade is, a, is an elusive thing, and as much as smuggling was frowned upon, I could just as easily justify my breaking of Rhodes' monopoly. After all, if it wasn't his monopoly, I'm sure he'd be up to similar tricks. Still, dealing with the pie always made me squeamish. Back in Timor, he had broken some unwritten rule among merchants, and any of my dealings with him now carried the taint of possible sin. As we sat in the shade of a baobab then, I observed his desiccated form, his snaggled teeth and livid flesh, and for a moment believed what his legitimate counterparts said about moral offenses degenerating the features of their transgressors. Although he was obviously exhausted, the pie didn't sit long. Soon he was back on his feet and clambering onto his horse. Why the rush, pie? There is precious little rest for the servants of Christ, young Xavier, and I am most anxious to get to Beira. You're going all the way there? Usually the pie turned immediately to the southern colonies or veered southeast to the more lawless lands of Gaza, where he felt more at home. See, he replied, meaning yes, but neglected to elaborate. Instead, he spurred Rosa forward without another word. What's in Beira? Refusing to meet my eyes, he said, I am afraid that the shipment you hold in your hands will be the last one that I will be able to provide you with, Xavier. Kay! I whipped my burrow harder than I had meant to, and the beast trotted out ahead. I, however, stayed abreast of the pie and bawled. How come? Did you get caught? Nearly. Well, what happened? I was collared by one of the foremen as, as I was leaving the barracks. Apparently, he had been getting suspicious. I ended up in his office, a corrugated shack not too far from the living quarters. I gestured to the packet of jewels. So how did you manage to hold on to these? Bam, you know how I hide them? He reached into a, to a satchel and pulled out a Bible. Oldest trick in the book, literally. He opened the pages and revealed that instead of containing the word of God, the pages were hollowed out so as to conceal contraband. This will suffice for a cursory search after you minister to the natives, but it won't do for a real shakedown. This, he indicated the Bible once more, is not an original idea in any way. So what did you do? Walked into the anti-clerical's office, and as I leaned over far to take a seat, being, after all, an old man, I dropped the book on the floor and slid it under his desk with my feet. I wasn't surprised. I'd always expected the pie to have a light touch, and I could just imagine him 60 years ago as a young street urchin in Goa or even Lisbon, picking the pockets of passerby. And so they searched her person and found nothing. Coreto. I waltzed right out of there. How did you retrieve the Bible? 
As I left, I so clumsily knocked off some paper from the desk, which was a mess, and as I stooped to pick it all up, I quietly retrieved the good book and secreted it among my robes. A very good book, I mused, eyeing the diamonds again. I selected one and held it up to the sun. This one's a beauty, it's so large, and from what I can see, no flaws. He nodded sagely. I'll say one thing for those Kaffirs. They know how to pick them. What are you, going to become a walloper? You aren't fixing to become one of the tribe, are you? I ignored the slurs. But why are you going to Bay Rapai? Just because you had a close scape, scrape in Kimberley doesn't explain why you need to follow me into port. Because, young Savier, I do not know yet how close of a scrape it was. We reached the crest of the hill where the grass of the veld met with the trees of the forest. He wheeled Rosa around and pointed off into the valley laid out below us. Do you have any field glasses? I produced a small telescope and handed it to him, but he waved it away. Look for yourself on that trail that I came in on. What do you see? Peering through the spyglass, I replied, nothing. Now it was the pie's turn to squawk. K. Okay? He snatched the spyglass out of my hands and squinted through it himself. After a long, pregnant pause, he tore his gaze away and murmured, Beh, then that's a blessing, I suppose. He performed the sign of the cross devoutly. What was I supposed to see, I queried. He re I received a sharp look in return. The autos. My eyebrows arched in response. Am I expected to know who that is? The pie snorted dismissively. Everyone who's been to Kimberley knows who the autos are. Beh, there you are, I reasoned. I've never been to Kimberley. Who needs to tramp down to that backwater when the diamonds come so conveniently to you? I looked wistfully at the stash still in my hands. Or at least they used to. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods, that hypocrite snapped. Then he returned to the subject at hand. The autos, he explained, peering off into the forest, are two pagan tufts that are hired out by anyone wishing to get things done swiftly and in secret. Most often they are called upon to collect loans. It was my turn to give my companion a sharp look. Do you owe? A withering glance in reply. No more than usual, the pie harumphed, and I know my creditors. They have more civilized and godly ways to call in a favor. I have no idea why the autos would be on the road to Beira, but I have noticed this. Two strapping young men, such as the Otto, should have, at their own leisurely pace, caught up with and passed an old pie within minutes. Instead, they remained about a league from me the entire day yesterday. What am I to make of this? Nothing good, I agreed. Where do you suppose they are? I do not know, nor do I care. Perhaps I lost them in the night. Spotted hyenas were not the creatures from which I was riding, but rather the human variety. What do the Ottos look like, I offered, so that I can keep a lookout. I take it they're boars? One is. The two Ottos share only a name and an unholy sadism. The first is Bower's Boar, enormous and filthy, with a huge bushy beard and that barbaric Calvinist mindset. The other Otto isn't even European. He's a wiry little Javanese demon with the tenacity of a mongoose. Both are quite fond of hunting knives, talented too. I've seen too much of their handiwork to not grow concerned when I find them riding behind me. I grinned in spite of the situation. You seem to be very intimate with them. Just what company do you keep down in Kimberley Pie? Your sarcasm is most unappreciated, young Xavier. The pie informed me frostily. I am simply following in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus Christ, who consorted with leopards and tax collectors. It is my duty to administer to the dregs of society. What is your excuse? My grin only widened and my sarcasm sharpened. Only the pursuit of filthy lucre, pie. I certainly can't claim the moral high ground like you. If the pie was wise to my specious intent, he did not show it. Precisely. Now, if you do not mind, let's pick up the pace, shall we? He spurred Rosa on, and as we continued on the road to Beira, the forest closed in around us. <laughs> Darren Ralston. I was uh, inspired by Alyssa's reading yesterday to read sort of a make-out young love story. So this is from a larger short story that is currently in progress and has no title. Um, it's a story about first love and first job. <laughs> Summer employment. Um, they work in a weenie wagon at a artificial lake, a small Shenandoah Valley town. And at this point, um, the main character, Morris, is heading to a party that is being thrown for Stormy, his first love, her uh, mother. It's her birthday party, so he's arriving. The small house was on about five acres. There were several cars and motorcycles on the front lawn. Beside the house was a small barn where there was gathered a small crowd of men. 
Morris heard the growl of a motorcycle and saw a small plume of exhaust rise from the center of the group of men. Some wore leather vests, some were shirtless, and some wore t-shirts. It looked like all of them had tattoos of some kind or another. Morris hesitated to get out of the car. He'd seen how, bi uh, how bikers act in movies. They aren't nice, and they like to fight. He cut the car off, then stepped out, trying not to appear nervous. The men were holding cans of beer and talking about the bike. Most of them had beer bellies. One of the men moved aside as if presenting the motorcycle to Morris. 1951 Vincent Black Shadow Kid. He put his hand on Morris's shoulder in a fatherly way. Fucking gorgeous. Morris looked at the man straddling the bike. His ponytail was cinched with several rubber bands and he had a long goatee. He opened the throttle and the bike roared. It was amazing. Morris had never ridden a motorcycle, but he wanted to all of a sudden. The fatherly man introduced himself as Frank and then asked if Morris wanted a beer. Morris didn't hesitate. Yes, he said. Beer, Frank shouted. He caught the beer and handed it to Morris. Morris wasn't ready to go see Stormy just yet. He wanted to look at the motorcycle some more and watch it erupt dark smoke and noise. The man seated atop it let it idle and Morris watched as the bike trembled with power. He took a drink of his beer and winced. Frank gestured toward the man on the motorcycle. Lucky some bitch found it in a junkyard and fixed it like new. Is that Stormy's dad? He asked. Frank said, are you her boyfriend? Morris felt a little color come to his cheeks. No, I'm a co-worker. Frank laughed. It was Stormy's father. But he didn't look like a father, he looked like a biker. Can a biker be a father? <laughs> Morris watched and drank another sip of beer. It wasn't so bad the second time. Stormy's father leaned forward, rolling the machine under his own power until the kickstand clanked up. He held the clutch and clicked it into first gear. The group of men parted and he rode away. Fucking gorgeous, Frank said, fucking gorgeous. The group of men went into the barn where there were several other bikes, most antiques. There were two Indians and three Harleys, one of which looked like it might be from World War II. There were black and white posters on the walls of the shop from the 40s and 50s, posters of motorcycles and pinup girls. Morris's dad, he read newspapers and watched TV. Morris was talking to Frank when Stormy came to the barn. I thought I saw your car out here. Hey, Stormy. She took him by the hand and led him out of the barn. How was the Acres? She had been thinking about the, or he had been thinking about the Vincent. I'd rather not talk about it. She led him to the little ribbon of creek that ran behind the property. They sat down and he took a, and she took a sip of beer, of his beer. I want to kill the little shit. Hank? Yeah, he grabbed my tits last time I worked with him. He did? Morris looked at her. If he wasn't a little kid, I swear I'd punch him at least once. He lay back in the thick grass. Stormy lay down on her side, propping her head up on the heel of her palm. She played with Morris's hair. He told her about Hank pantsing him. She laughed and then apologized for laughing. He finished the rest of the beer and set the empty can on his stomach. It is kind of funny, though. Well, maybe to you, he said, and then sat up. I'm going to get another beer. Do you want one? Sure. When Morris came back, he was already drinking his beer and had two more in his hands. He handed one to Stormy. She opened it and set the can down on the grass. She looked at him gently. Morris didn't say anything. Morris didn't say anything. He wouldn't have known what to say even if he'd wanted to. What he did instead was lean over and kiss her. It was a soft, tentative kiss, the kind that doesn't risk offending anyone. Gauging Stormy's reaction, he decided he should kiss her again. This time it was more deliberate. He had wanted to do this for a long time, but never really had seen it as a possibility. But at that moment, he didn't care about possibilities. I wondered if you were ever going to do that, she said when she caught her breath. By the time Morris left, he still had a little beer buzz and drove home with it knocking around in his head. He was happy now. The day had turned out well. He and Stormy made out again just before he left. When he got home, he took a shower to wash out the charcoal smell and went to bed early. His, 
parents not suspecting a thing. Something inside Morris had caused him to apologize the next day for making out with Stormy. She told him that she wasn't sorry, and that he shouldn't be either. She said that if it was a problem, well, they didn't have to make out anymore. Morris apologized for apologizing. <laughs> and at the end of the day, when they were closing up the weenie wagon, after they lowered its awnings, they made out again in the dark. Who are, who are the poets again that are going today? And you are? Doug Arnold. Doug Arnold? Okay. Let's go ahead and have Doug up here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this poem is entitled uh, Portrait of a Saxophone in Synesthesia. I love to feel the saxophones sending shivers up my mind. Every tone, every measure finely honed, slicing paper cuts nearly to the bone in the fingertips of pleasure and of pain. I love to watch the, I love to watch the saxophone telescoping time, telling old important stories as do old men, who in the careful telling make it seem like the story was never told before. Yes, you can gaze and wonder at the sounds of its voices, but you can never paraphrase the tales told by a serious saxophone. I love to ride the rhythms of the saxophone, like riding a raptor gliding on and off the thermals, which rise like altos from the earth. Mounted on the looping back of the instrument, I wrap my legs tightly. After all, I've got a saxophone by the tail and we plunge down and deep as a growling blues note next to Mr. Melancholy at the bar. But he smiles, and now I smell it too. It's the viscous breath of the turgid saxophone, hinting at something funky in the future. Just follow your nose down the ever-narrowing trail of words to where all meaning peters out. Drift to the sea, slapping gently. You'll hear through the luminous morning mist, a saxophone solo building bridges to worlds, to words where world, I'm sorry, to worlds where words will never take you. This is called The Two Brothers. Except for a few erudite English teachers, everyone mistakenly calls me metaphor, the name of my glib brother which is like killing me slowly with a thousand slights. For my name is Simile. Hear me shout it like a bugle, blasting reveille. Simile, Simile. No one's going to ignore me into vanishing like Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. OK, when people compare us, I admit I'm a little chunkier due to my love handles of like and as than my trim, facile brother. And yeah, of course, Metaphor has a higher name recognition because like a cheap stage magician, he'll make anything into something else. Although metaphor himself is a metaphor for an unsubstantial society embracing a shifty, superficial syntax of life. I mean, come on. The moon was a ghostly galleon is a ghastly oversimplification about as accurate as astrology. Whereas I, with my simple like, could have grounded that galleon in reality, yet still floated it in the sky. When you want substance, you want me, simile. And actually, not to be a thorn in his reputation, but just between you and me, metaphor suffers from clinical hyperbole. <laughs> The Allentown Fairgrounds proudly presents. Strutting, stalking across the stage, she was a sweat-polished saber-toothed tiger with high heels like claws. She wasn't just a singer. She was an incandescence, thrumming with enough megawatts to reignite a distant dying sun. Her voice was honey with a few shards of comb and a couple of stingers left in. 
It was redolent of catfish frying at a church picnic. It was gravel caressing. Her songs were as insinuating as my hand sliding pleasurably beneath and as driving pure as the drums in her backup band. She double dared us all until I pressed my heart's accelerator hard against the floor. That woman stole my Cotton Mather's soul and resurrected it as rock and roll. And 22 years later, forced to choose, I would exchange my two enlightening days studying the Florentine Cathedral, Santa Marie del Fiore, and listening to its soaring celebration in the motet Nuper Rosarium Floris for just those two hours of experiencing Tina's earthbound joy. Thank you. Pauline Palco. This is from a story, that, it's the beginning of a story called The House on January Drive. So much a part of the mountain, the house isn't visible at first. It appears suddenly, looming at the end of a steep, narrow, poorly surfaced road, giving anyone approaching a feeling of being observed. Cut into and flanked on three sides by ledges, it is cradled by layers of jagged stone that rise above the slate roof and its three chimneys. A scant patch of grass surrounds the house, and a ring of white quartz marks the boundaries of the lot. Polished cement slabs form the walk and driveway that span the drainage ditch along the road and give the impression of being able to be raised quickly if necessary. Cathedral windows, which overlook the drive and beyond the valley that is Scranton, remain perpetually draped. 800 yards to the east and 40 degrees downslope kneels the shell of a home begun then interrupted, its framing and beams abandoned to weather the elements exposed. Within the walls of stone at the end of January Drive, the Sykes held a holiday gathering, the first in three years. Their annual holiday party, traditionally hosted the weekend before Christmas, had ceased once they had moved from Big Bass Lake. A few people, other administrators, faculty, the assistant dean and her husband, People who felt obligated and uncertain had stopped by shortly after the move. One or two of them had been invited in. Once the borough road has been left behind, the drive to the Sykes residence is perilous, even under the best of driving conditions. With a chance of snow and sleet predicted and darkness falling early, Hope wasn't sure she wanted to go. In fact, given the recent death of her mother, she was positive she didn't. From the moment the invitation had been laid on her desk, she had strained for a commitment that would allow her to bow out gracefully. Daily, during the long dark commute from work, she prayed for sleep, a dreamless fairy tale sleep that would blanket her in a fog and remain for several weeks, at least until the hours of daylight increased. You have to, Tess said. Can I just say I'm not up to it? Does she really expect me to go? She'll make your life miserable if you don't. Hope looked at Tess over the copy machine and said, she can try. We'll go together. I'll introduce you. Be your party buddy. There's always great food. The afternoon of the party, Hope stood in her closet, sliding hangers back and forth. You'll see everything from sequined evening gowns and updos to jeans and wet hats, Tess had told her. Mostly in between. Wear what you want. Hope chose navy dress slacks and her favorite sweater, vanilla snowflakes hand embroidered on the background of navy chenille. The neckline, sleeves, and hem were banded with deep purple. It draped from her shoulders like silk and was as warm as an embrace. She sat on the edge of her bed in slacks and bra and smoothed the sweater across her lap. Two years earlier, it had hung on a display rack on the back wall of Christopher and Banks. The most beautiful sweater she had ever seen, it reminded her of cold, star-filled evenings sledding on the hill near her childhood home. Those winter evenings when she was 11 years old, Hope and her friends rode down Rowley's Knob. When the Methodist church bell had tolled six times and porch lights had popped on along River Street, they took the final run of the day. The shouts and jeers of the pack was subdued with homework and Baz looming ahead. She walked with her friends to the wooden bridge that spanned Van Auken Creek, then turned back alone and pulled her sled to the top of the hill. The summit was quiet, so still that when she considered the depths of the boundless sky, she became dizzy 
and heard the stars twinkle, a lullaby hum softly, lips pressed close to her ear. She lay on her sled, searching and listening. When shivering limbs and chattering teeth took her, she added to the lullaby the creaking of snow beneath the soles of her boots and the shush of waxed runners as she pulled her sled along the railroad tracks and then climbed Station Hill Road. Her eyes watered from the bite in the air. Her scarf was damp and held the smell of her breath beneath her nose. Her toes ached and her stomach growled. She anticipated milky tea and warm sweet rolls with butter as she watched for headlights following the steep curve through the trees. Packed snow is just like ice under the tires of a car, her mother had warned her, afraid she could forget the sometimes fatal decree of winter's roads. You see headlights, you get out of the way. Hope had paled at the price and quickly returned the sweater to the rack, but her mother had taken it to the register. It suits you, she had said to Hope's protest. I'll put it under the tree. Hope swiped a finger across her cheek and slipped the sweater over her head. Um, Andrea Schoenthal? This is the beginning of a story. <clears throat> it's called Laura Jean. 1957. When she got home from high school, she found the front door locked and no one there. Mom not home? What to do? Or to look for her? What to think? Mom could be across the street gossiping with Mrs. Haggerty. But Mom wouldn't lock the door to run across the street. The corner store? Not at this time of day. Visiting Grandma and Grandpa, but Mom knew she'd be coming home from school. Leaving her books and purse on the edge of the porch, she ran down the stairs. Then she walked all around the house. She tried the back door. That was locked, too. She opened the gate, went into the backyard, looked up into the bedroom windows. There was no sign of activity in her room or in her parents' room, either. She looked further up to the small attic window. No light up there. Where could Mom be? She turned to the front of the house, walked up the stairs and across the porch, tried the front door again. Yes, it was locked, all right. Mrs. Haggerty might know where Mom was, or Mrs. Popovich next door, one of the other neighbors. Someone had to know. She went from house to house to house. The few people home had no answers. She went back home, sat on the stairs, tried to think. Tuesday. Mom did the quick dusting and vacuuming on Tuesdays, made breaded pork chops for dinner. Might do some mending. There was that brow with a broken strap. She tried to remember. Did Mom say something before school? Eat your breakfast. Don't forget your lunch. Wear your plaid skirt and green sweater. Lay them out for you on your bed. Don't forget your book report. Did you finish that outline for your biology project? Hurry up. Don't be late for school. She looked at her watch. Four o'clock. Dad would be home soon. She jumped up. Dad home soon. She'd be home in the... She'd be alone in the house with Dad. Where was Mom? Mom had to come home before Dad. Alone in the house with Dad? No, not ever, not ever again. She was up and down the sidewalk in front of the house, checking her watch every few minutes. Maybe Dad had missed one bus and had to wait for the next one. Maybe he was working overtime. She was certain she would see him coming down Riverside Avenue from the corner bus stop, carrying his lunch pail any minute now. Four. 45. Dad hadn't come home yet. No dad, nor mom. Where were they? She could walk over to her grandparents' house. Even though mom and dad wouldn't be there, she could stay with her grandparents until her parents returned. So back down the steps, she reached up to get her notebook and her purse. Took a sheet of paper from her notebook, tore a pen from the purse, and set them back up on the edge of the porch, porch with her school books. Then she began to write mom and dad a note. Five minutes later, a taxi cab came down the street and stopped in front of the house. Mom climbed out of the cab. A ca taxi cab? Why was Mom coming home in a taxi cab? <clears throat> Laura Jean, I'm so sorry, Mom said. I thought I'd be home long before school let out. Where were you, Mom? Where, where's Dad? Isn't he with you? He hasn't come home from work yet. Dad is in the hospital. Why? What hospital? Uh, is he hurt? Did he get hurt at work? 
Mom sat down beside her on the steps. No, he's... Mom sighed a long, deep sigh. I had your father committed to the state hospital. It was that, or jail. When I talked to police, I didn't know where to go or who to call. I ended up calling the police. They said they could go to the factory and arrest him, or help me take him to the hospital. I chose the hospital. Laura Jean, why didn't you tell me? She stared at her mother. What was she talking about? Why didn't she make sense? Let's go in, Mom said. I'll make us some supper. Why is Dad in the hospital? You didn't tell me why. I found your diary. I read it. Come on, Laura Jean. Let's have some supper. I want to eat early and do the dishes and go to bed. It's a very long day. My diary? Mom tried again to coax her inside. She wouldn't budge. Her diary, her most intimate thoughts. I found out what happened, Mom said. I found out what I feared, that my suspicions. You read my diary? How could you? Laura Jean, she glared at Mother. Well, aren't you glad I found out? Aren't you relieved it's all over? Laura Jean turned away. Fine, suit yourself. Mom went to the house. Laura Jean slowly walked to the stairs, picked up her books in her purse, walked across the porch, and opened the front door. Walking right past her mother, who was in the kitchen, she went straight to her room. She threw her purse and her books onto her bed. She took her diary out of her underwear drawer, where she had hidden it, where under her panties and bras, where she thought it would be safe from prying eyes. When Mom put the branded bra away, she must have seen it there. But to read it? How could she? Laura Jean threw her diary into the waste paper basket and closed her bedroom door. A lock. That's what she needed. A lock on her door. Except that now it was too late. Much, much too late. Mac Barrett. This story is not yet titled. Um, it's part of a story cycle. Um, the story that I submitted to my workshop is also part of that cycle, for those of you here. Um, okay. The two of them, husband and wife of exactly 20 years, were slouched into their seats at their regular table at the regular pub. She inserted the last bite of her hamburger with tweezers made from her thumb and pointer. With a steady hand, he tilted a quaff of dark stout, allowing it to fill his mouth. Her lips and cheeks pursed and slowly rotated around the food. The motion stopped when her throat flinched, and her mouth was clear. She extended her palms outward in a knit of fingers that loudly cracked each knuckle joint. The lump in his throat bobbed, and the stout drained from his mouth in three even swallows, leaving a bitter paste on his tongue. In this way, silence typified their time together. There was so much not to say. Twenty years, to, Twenty years today, she thought, with a deep sense of loss. Two full decades had passed since they had married. She thought of their son, who had passed away tragically at only half the age of their marriage. She thought of how much worthier he was of such longevity. Shortly after his passing, they had moved to this, to this place, a small town named Dunvegan on the east coast of Scotland. This was a few years ago. It was the peace of the place which had attracted them, or perhaps the idea of that peace. Pace is the main word they had used with friends back at home in the city. We need a change of pace, she would say, and setting, he would add. Why Scotland, they would ask. Ancestry and such, he would say. I thought you were Irish, they would say. So does everybody else, he would respond. As conversations like these went on in their final weeks before departure, boxes filling and accumulating in the living room, the city would blur past their window in a fuming spectrum of color and volume that confirmed their decision to go. They wanted a mountain instead of a building, a friendly neighborhood dog instead of a growling homeless man, a walk instead of a cab ride, a flowing stream you could dip your hand into instead of a filth-stiffened river that had drawn from the world the life of a loved one. The pint was more or less finished. A foamless inch appeared squalid in the bottom of the glass. His one hand supported his chin, and the other lay still on the table. The thought of another pint entered his head, and he turned from it, knowing that the niece would be bothered. He had come to learn, through the blur of years, that she was the kind of woman who found it more important to have her dislikes remembered than her likes. His marriage was therefore lived according to the following principle. 
preservation by the prioritization of aversions over affinities. He wrote it down on an index card and stuck it in the back of the miscellaneous store beneath the pile of receipts. For instance, it was always a bigger deal to her if he offered her some guacamole and forgot her allergy to avocado than if he brought home a pint of her favorite ice cream. He also had to remember that she does not like anything with hot tomatoes in any form, whether it be pasta sauce or pizza. Tomatoes, no matter the form, she would repeat, are always better cold. She also hates the cold. Her skin is thin, cold weather bruises and gets inside her bones. However, she is reasonable and values the cold for the wonder it brings to warmth. Brightly lit rooms offend her sensibilities, especially brightly lit restaurants. Never take her to a place without ambiance. She does not like water or heights. They both scare her, don't make fun, don't suggest parasailing. And of course, she does not like drunkenness before sunset, though he is constantly trying to remember all of them. This is the most important. She is cold, he thinks, as she rubs her hands together, but he then remembers not to offer to get her any soup because there's only tomato. She'll only conclude that you weren't listening. She'll conclude with a stern look that you were never listening. When she asked, in her simple, sudden way, what he was thinking, he knew somehow that his answer was important, maybe from her tone. Perhaps it was, perhaps it was from the way she sat, utterly still, looking at him for an answer. He felt in that moment that something heavy and possibly life-altering hinged on the movement of his tongue. He drew his eyes up from her hands, which were busy massaging themselves, and met her stare squarely. I was thinking about how much I hate the way you crack your knuckles, he thought. Did you know I hate that? So he said, nothing, and silence came in behind the word. Without adjusting his stare, she nodded a small, slow nod, and then lowered her eyes as if contemplating something. Then her stillness broke. Her chair made a harsh sound against the wooden floor as she pushed out from the table. She swung her jacket widely onto her body. Her hands peeked through and grabbed her woolen hat from the table. She stood for a moment. Her eyes emptied onto his small body, which was still and perched at the table for two. His mouth made and remade a small, silent O, oh, like a fish. This was the moment he would remember as he sat alone at the table in the weeks and months to come. Her presence replaced with a pint, emptying himself into it. He would ask himself, during that time, why he had let her leave, why he had not moved from the table and followed her. He knew what kind of woman she was, but some aversion he had not accounted for had clearly come into play. He had done something she had not liked. He would have to admit to himself later that he knew something of the meaning of, de of her departure. Some part of him could tell what was happening, so he had to wonder, some innumerable count of days later, why it was that he did not stop her or try to. As the door shut heavily behind her, he felt the life he knew moving away from him. It had been a life which had required a lot of him. He had been expected to understand her, to live the verb of love and not simply provide the noun. It had been his job to make sure his hand felt tender and soft on her back as she sat at the edge of the bed on their son's birthday, crying into her palms. He had to be careful not to let the caress become monotonous, chafing, or too mechanical. He had to offer soft words when he noticed a tear hit the page of a book over which she leaned, without even asking why. The novel he had written so long ago made her weep. He had to fill those words with meaning, and he had many other chores as well, things he resented, like filling the cupboards with groceries, answering phones, and sweeping floors. He spent his days stuck in the house, helping her run the business, trying to keep her happy, trying to be mindful of the weight of a mother's loss. He changed the channel whenever a drowning was foreshadowed. It had been, it had been a difficult life, these years, the two of them alone in a house in Scotland, but as he sensed it end, he seemed, it seemed to him not altogether undesirable. <laughs> Mary Ann, I can't read the last name, is there Mary Ann? <laughs> Freshman. Thanks, Nick. Um, this is a short enough story that I think I can read it in five minutes, but don't time me. <laughs> Artificial sweetener. I sprinkled the contents of the little pink packet on my cereal and wondered how long it would be before I died of cancer. My mother isn't worried about me dying of cancer. She just doesn't want me to die of embarrassment. 
At least that's what she says. You'll be so glad we got rid of this baby fat now before you go to high school. I'm in eighth grade now, so we're on a crash program. Counting calories, weighing portions, and even exercising. Ugh. My mother is an expert when it comes to losing weight. She used to be quite heavy. I just let myself go after I had my babies. Every year I added on another couple of pounds that just never went away. Then my dad went away, moved in with that floozy Joyce from his office. And my mother decided she'd show him she started losing all kinds of weight and joined a health club and got regular manicures. She even got a pedicure. She never looked so good. When my mother started dieting like crazy, anything good to eat disappeared from the house. She was never Susie Homemaker, but she used to make cookies once in a while, and we always had ice cream after supper when we were watching TV. Suddenly, there were no chips, no cookies, no ice cream, no hostess Twinkies, no nothing. My brother and I took to hanging out at our friends' houses after school, eating cookies that their moms baked. I used some of my lunch money to buy my own boxes of Twinkies and hostess cupcakes and kept them hidden in my locker at school. She'd have found them if I stashed them anywhere in my room. As a result, while my mother was losing all kinds of weight, I began to put on the pounds. My brother, who is almost two years younger than me, didn't have a problem because just about that time he had a tremendous growth spurt and would have been really skinny if he wasn't packing in the calories. But me, all of a sudden, I had this baby fat, which I'd never had before. My mother really hadn't noticed until she ran into Stephanie Brennan and her mother at the grocery store. Mrs. Brennan was bragging up how Stephanie had done so well in the pom-pom auditions, and then Stephanie blabbed that she was so surprised when I didn't even try out. <clears throat> when my mother came home from the store, she headed straight for my room where I was working on the next day's algebra assignment. I'm pretty good at math, and I like to do a good job on my homework because my math teacher, Mr. Franks, is so cool, and he always compliments me on my papers. Not just a scribbled note on the paper, although that's nice too, but he makes a point of saying, Good work, Monica. So here's my mother barging into my room without even knocking and all of a sudden giving me a hard time about not trying out for the pom-pom squad. Why on earth didn't you try out for pom-poms? Ever since you were a little girl, you've been really good at cartwheels and splits and all that other stuff they do. Surely you would have made the squad if you had tried out. I don't think so, Mother, I said. Actually, I didn't have anything to wear to the tryouts. All my leotards and shorts had shrunk or something. Nothing fits. My mother stood there looking at me. Then you could see something registering as she started eyeing me up and down. Stand up. I stood up. Turn around. Slowly I turned around, hoping my sweats would camouflage the added pounds she had not noticed until that moment. That was a week ago. Since then, there had been a whole lot of celery in my life. When you open the refrigerator, that's what you saw, little bags of cut up celery and carrots. My mother suggested we make a competition out of it. We'd see who could lose the most weight each week. She was gung-ho to reach her target by the end of the school year because her class reunion was coming up. She had gone to an all-girl Catholic high school, but they held their reunion with the alumni of the all-boy Catholic high school that had been just down the street. Both schools are closed now. I really wasn't sure who my mother was more anxious to impress, her own classmates or the guys, but it didn't matter. She had real incentive. I, on the other hand, could care less. I didn't want to be my mother's weight loss buddy. I didn't have a class reunion looming up ahead of me. Oh, but you have high school ahead of you next year. The impression you make when you walk through those doors the first day of your freshman year will stick with you all four years. You'll thank me for this one day. My brother threatened to go live with my dad and Joyce. There's nothing to eat here but rabbit food, he yelled, slamming the refrigerator door. I don't need to diet. This isn't fair. I'm going to go live somewhere where a guy can have a bowl of ice cream. My mother couldn't stand the thought of my brother preferring to live with my dad and Joyce, although in all likelihood, Joyce would have put the kibosh on that idea pretty quickly. Anyway, my mom went to the store and brought home my brother's favorite, Ben and Jerry's cookie dough ice cream. For us, she loaded up on little chocolate soy ice cream sandwiches. They're 50 calories each. That'll tell you how good they are. <laughs> our, our first weigh-in together was this morning. I won. I actually lost more weight this week, two whole pounds, than my mother did. She only lost one pound. She congratulated me and then felt 
she should caution me about becoming overconfident with this initial victory. You'll naturally lose more weight at the very beginning. I've been working at it for months now, and I'm to the point where the pounds come off very slowly. She put her arm around my shoulders and gave me a little mother-daughter hug. I just don't want you to think you can cheat on your diet and still lose weight. Then off she went to the health club for her aerobics class. My mother offered to have me go along to be her guest this one time, just to see if you like it, honey. I declined. I said I had bad cramps and anyway I had a science project to work on. Our project group was going to be getting together this afternoon at Janet's house and I wanted to get an outline ready for us. Besides, there was always the possibility that Janet's mom would have baked cookies. Okay, I'll see you later. Remember, no cheating. You're doing so well, you don't want to ruin your great start. So here I am eating Kellogg's Special K with fake sugar and skim milk. I go to the fridge and take out some blueberries and measure a half cup to put on my cereal for a reward. Actually, the berries taste pretty good. And this weight loss thing probably isn't a bad idea. It's just that I miss the cookies we used to have around here. All these substitutes leave a bad taste in my mouth. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to read a few poems. First poem is entitled, The Tail Club for Men. I was born without a tail, and it's a good thing, because every time I meet someone I really like, I get all excited. I'd be knocking stuff off the coffee table all the time. I wonder if this bothers my dog, that maybe he thinks this guy who feeds me, walks me, takes me for rides, he's nice and everything, but well, you know, he has no tail. <laughs> but really, I think it doesn't matter at all. So I guess I don't have to surf the net for miracle tail growth products or join the tail club for men. A good idea is to find someone who loves you the way your dog loves you, who loves the smell of your crotch. <laughs> Tail or no tail. <laughs> this is called Funeral Home. The widow was wailing. His first wife came, bestowed a kiss lightly on his cheek. I patted his cold hand. He looked dead. Goodbye, I said. We all reminisced over coffee and those little Italian cookies. On the way home, I passed 10 or 12 crows together, looking at each other, cawing, looking up the road, pecking at a flattened squirrel on the pavement. This is called Coach. Because I was afraid of ground balls, he hit them at me, made me stand in front of them until I cried. He kept hitting them at me, hard. They hit me in the arms, in the neck, in the face. Then it was dark on the little league field. We were still there, a has-been athlete do-gooder and a scrawny 10-year-old. He drank beer and spent weekends on his boat. He carried a pistol and liked to go to the dump to shoot rats. We could hardly see and he was still hitting them at me until in the dark I stood, unafraid and caught every single one. Uh, this is entitled <clears throat> To His Coy Mistress, Eighth Grade Version. <laughs> I gave you a box of chocolates. You looked at me, wrinkling your face as if I were a bad smell. If only you had tasted one, just one, with the love drops I carefully injected. If only someone had dug up that invisible fence you built around yourself, then, then I would take you for a wild walk where the water leaps from the rocks and diamonds fall. Then, if, if, 
A giant boxing glove would swing down from the sky and knock you into a field of wildflowers. Chooping, excuse me, chirping bluebirds will circle around your head and we would kiss and mate among the weeds as the white tiger mates. And then you would like me. <laughs> this is my final poem, The History of the World. The gods, before they moved to Olympus, lived in a boarding house on Filbert Street. They had the neighborhood in an uproar with their betrayals, murder, incest, couplings with beasts. My <laughs> piano teacher, Mr. Gambini, lived next door. We could hear them through the open window next to the spinet. He'd shake his head. Mythos over ethos, he'd say. It's the history of the world. <laughs> they were noisy. Our neighbors complained. I was sorry when they moved away. Diana lived there disturbing us with her beauty. Once, behind our garage, I touched her. Mother said she was a slut. Mother was mistaken. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. I can't read your name. Patty? Harvey. Looks like I'm the last one, so everyone can relax. Um, I'm going to read a, a short short or ultra short or micro short, I don't know what exactly it's called. And um, it's called When Lizards Fall. And the only word you need to know in this is Dadima, which is uh, a Hindi word for grandmother. Hindi is the language of northern India. Why didn't Ma cook for us today, my brother asks. I hate Dadima's cooking, sneaking green chilies into everything. We are both high in the flame tree by the edge of the compound wall, its curtain of deep orange flowers hiding us from the house. I sit on a thick branch, the bark rough between my legs but cool, even on this hot day. Ma would be angry if she saw me. She does not think a 10-year-old girl should climb trees. My brother looks up at me from his perch on a fork below me. His mouth is open wide, tongue stretched out to the hot noon air, and he pants, trying to cool his mouth. Green flecks of the chili-laden spinach from lunch shine on his teeth. Spit webs glisten at the corners of his mouth. A lizard fell on Ma at night, I explained to my brother, recounting my mother's explanation to me. It slipped off the wall and onto her while she was sleeping. She has to sit on a mat for four days till the lizard poison wears off. Then she'll have an oil bath to wash off any poison that's left. She can't cook for us till then. His eight-year-old eyes are wide as he starts to chew on the neem tail twig that Ma says will make his teeth strong and white. Now and then he rests the twig in the gap between his front teeth and twiddles it up and down with his tongue. How come a lizard falls on her every month, he pesters. I want one to fall on me too. <laughs> Why? I shudder at the thought of a lizard touching me. Do you want to sit on a mat by yourself for four days? Uh-uh, he says. I grab hold of it tight before it could squirt its slime and put it in a box. His fist closes and slides open rapidly as his lizard is made prisoner. I might teach it tricks, make it my pet. I look at the sky, a bleached blue in the noon heat. I'm afraid of lizards, their beady eyes, the slithering ridge tails that move wildly, even when severed from their bodies. Why does Ma talk only to me about the lizards? Is he too young to hear about such things? Do you think the lizards stay away from Dadima because she's so mean, he asks. I would like her to be stuck to a mat for four days. <laughs> Not able to pinch our ears, our cheeks, or with her bony fingers, I say in a sing-song, completing his sentence for him. We are both silent, imagining Ma, light-hearted and free for four days, with Dadi Ma confined to a small room, unable to follow her about with her scolds and her taunts. I notice that my brother is looking at me slyly, out of the corner of his eye. My friend Rohit, he told me how babies are made, he announces, and then tosses it, his head back to look straight up at me. The flame flowers stain a pattern onto his face so that he looks like he has a mask on. He doesn't know anything. He's only eight, I answer, wise with my ten years. 
I'm eight too, and I know lots of things. My brother's cheeks are flushed, his skin shiny with sweat. I know better than you how babies are made. Tell me how, I say, as I begin to turn the flour that I hold in my fist into an orange paste. There is a thudding in my stomach. Maybe the green chilies from lunch are upsetting it too. The boy, the man, says my brother, a half smile lifting up one corner of his mouth. And then his gaze slides away from me and he rolls off the tree, landing on the ground with a soft plop. On my perch, I am the wise queen. Let me tell you how babies are made, I offer. The man holds the woman's face in his hands, puts his lips on her lips, tells her the secret, and then he blows into her mouth. My brother looks up, his hand shading his eyes. What secret does he tell her, he demands. Whether it'll be a boy or a girl. And the man and the woman, they both have to stay alive till the baby comes. Otherwise, the baby goes back to heaven. I'm breathless with my words, not entirely sorry that I cannot reel them back in. My brother has rolled over onto his stomach. He's very still. What's the matter? Are you hurt? I ask. You don't know anything, silly girl. Daddy died when I was in Ma's stomach, and I'm still here, aren't I? He rolls back and he draws his knees up to his stomach and begins to rock faster and faster till I'm dizzy just looking at him. He stops suddenly and that half smirk is back on his face as he looks up at me. I notice that my dress is bunched up on my hips and I tug it down roughly over my knees. The bright sun makes gold of the dry weeds just beyond the tree and a dark ripple at their base makes me wonder if a lizard is scurrying about looking for shade. I think of the picture of Ma and Daddy on the dresser drawer. Ma looks happy there with Daddy's arm around her. I think of the hours she spent sleeping on her mat with the lizard's monthly visits, and I swallow hard. I jump down from the tree. My legs feel weak, not as strong as when I climbed so high just a short while ago. I begin to reach out a hand to my brother to help him up, but I, but I stop. I'm not sure I want to touch his sweaty hand. His arms are still locked around his knees, his skinny body curved into an arc. The cords are tight in his neck as he strains to hold his head up and look straight at me. Lizards only fall on girls, you know that, right? Says my brother. I start walking, fast. Behind me, I can hear my brother scramble to his feet. I lurch through the weeds, unmindful of the grass lizards that lurk there. I don't know where to go, so I head away from the house, away from Ma and Dadima, away from the mats. There is a loud pounding in my ears, and so it is only when I stop to catch my breath that I hear my brother. I won't let the lizards fall on you, he gasps, hurrying behind me. I turn to look at him. Blood trickles down the side of his calf where he has scratched himself. His shorts are a checkerboard of grass and mud. His eyebrow arches up in the way it does when he's about to cry. I hold, him, I hold my hand out to him. And if they do, I'll put them in a box for you, I say. My brother smiles. Thank you. Anybody else? We got everybody? Great. Okay, so tonight, uh, dinner at now, or 6 o'clock. Drinks now, dinner at 6. The reading at 8 o'clock at the Colgate University Bookstore downtown. We'll try to meet at that circle over by the dorm at about 7.15. Um, so those of you with cars who are happy to drive people, please slide into that circle. If you're interested in walking, it's only about a 12-minute walk. So. And oh, I want to mention the, the address list, the back of the room, and also the survey about the conference. See you later. Thanks. <laughs>